in the world of venture capital, what should everyone stop doing? Competing. <laughs> I think it's a very collaborative space. The more we collaborate and cooperate with each other, the more the founders win. We try to think, okay, it's great to build the bridge. How can we become the bridge? The only constant in life is change. And that's not just a saying. It's really the only way that your day is going to happen is the way it's meant to happen. When you're in a state of oneness with yourself and true to who you are, then you can be a lot more creative and add a lot of value and people will ultimately be happy to pay you for that value that you're adding. So funding these companies that can do well and do good and really impact people's lives, even in a very small way, is necessary when we think about how we allocate capital. Welcome back to the Change Officer podcast. My guest today is not just a founder and investor. She is one of the world's top 50 women in tech as identified by Forbes magazine. She's also the only Arab woman in the Middle East running a VC fund and the first woman to lead an IPO in the region, listing it for $1.1 billion. I am super excited to introduce you to Noor Shweit, the incredibly passionate and successful founder of Global Ventures. Three years ago, Noor left her role as Chief Investment Officer at Dubai Future Foundation to start her own fund. She thought that in emerging markets, founders are even more resilient than other entrepreneurs because they have to work harder to secure the resources they need. That's how she decided to invest in innovative and disruptive companies in emerging markets. With a portfolio of mission-driven companies creating solutions for global issues, Noor is changing the world in the process. I guarantee you learn something super valuable from Noor in this wide-ranging conversation. She is an amazing example of the power of determination and commitment. She will inspire you to embrace your ambition and commit to hard work of making a mark. She truly embodies the term disruptor and the concept of adding value wherever she goes. Without further ado, meet the incredible Noor Schwedt. Welcome to the Change Officer, Noor. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here. I've been looking forward to the conversation. Um, did a lot of research, so I'm going to try not to repeat all of the questions that you've been asked already. Um, there is a bunch of podcasts, of webinars, um, uh, presentations, keynotes where people can get familiar with what you do and, and, and the history. So I'm going to try just for the listeners who are maybe not aware who you are and knows your background, I'm going to try to summarize it really quickly. You were born and raised in many different countries. Um, you studied in the US, then you moved to Dubai in 2005. Um, you spent some time in consulting. Uh, you joined the uh, family business Deepa, just for a few days, right, in the beginning? A few weeks? Three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> turned down into a couple of months, turned uh, to, to a couple of years. Eventually, you managed the, and led the IPO, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is like, wow. You stayed with Deepa for a couple of years later, five, or five, five years, years after that. IPO. Yeah, you found in the meantime you founded Zog, uh, Yoga Studio. Yeah. Zen Yoga, there is one in, in the in the ground floor. I'm just building. Is this, I know. Was this the first one? This was the first one. No way. In 2006. <laughs> so when I walked in here today, I was like, oh, oh this brings me so many memories. <laughs> this is good. State, setting up the state for the conversation. <laughs> Um, in one of the interviews, you said that this taught you that building something from zero to one is much harder than actually managing a billion dollar company. Yeah, in some ways, much harder. Which is kind of hard to process, but okay. Um, after a couple of years in lead ventures, you eventually started Global Ventures with Basil uh, in 2018. And now three years later, Global Ventures is considered by, by many one of the leading <coughs> VCs in, in the region. So. What was the problem that you wanted to solve when you decided to start Global Ventures? So as an entrepreneur, it's always interesting to look at the problems around you and see which ones might I be able to tackle and you know, make a little bit of a difference in. In this case, it's the access to capital for founders. So I believe that founders in the region that are starting companies don't have as much access to capital, strategic capital, networked capital, capital with operating backgrounds as they should. And so starting Global Ventures was really with a mindset of, can we provide strategic capital to founders? And then Global Ventures, because we believe that founders can grow global companies from anywhere, including the region. Awesome. So since 2018, mm -hmm. has this changed? 
there's more capital in the ecosystem, but still not enough. Not so enough. It's, it's changed a very little bit. It, it still needs to change a lot more. Yeah, there's still, there's like, do you think there is a significantly more space for, for that change or we're like halfway there? We're still about $26 billion away. So if you take a look in the region. That was very precise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we invest 0.02% of our GDP into VC as a region. Mm -hmm. um, the US invests 0.7 or 0.8% almost. Europe invests 0.3%. We're 0.02%. Oh. So that okay. gap is annually $26 billion. Wow. Okay. So when we discussed about doing the podcast together, you said that the most important question to be answered is how to align capital with a positive intent and leave the world a better place than before. Yes. So I'd like to unpack that a bit more for, for <laughs> anyone who is listening <laughs> and deep dive okay. into that. Like, what do you mean by that? So, you know, we live in a part of the world where we are fortunate and blessed to live in infrastructure that enables us to really build and scale companies and attract talent and we have electricity 24 hours a day. We have internet whenever we need it. And yet, if you take a look all around us, there's a couple of billion people within a six hour flight or an eight hour flight that are not as blessed. And so if we wanna address problems that these people face on a day-to-day -day level, like financial inclusion, like healthcare inclusion, like food security, access to enough food, um, even electricity, then we can invest in technologies that address these problems and become very intentional investors and have huge markets around us because essentially there's hundreds of millions, if not billions of people who need these services and create them in a way, given that technology is ubiquitous, that really changes people's lives. Mm. So you can do well and do good. It's not that difficult. It's about mindset and intentionality. Mm, okay. Do you think there is <clears throat> enough startups Enough is a big word, but do you think there is enough startups out there tackling these problems as you would like them to tackle? Yes. Aligned with this. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've always been, you know, mission driven since mm -hmm. we started Global Ventures. So it's job growth is a great example. So in the region we have forty percent unemployment in our youth. That's four zero. Wow. And half our population is youth. So if you invest in fast growth companies, so in the US, for example, a VC-backed company creates 2.8 times as many jobs as a non-VC-backed company. So if you invest in fast-growth companies, they're more likely to create jobs, so therefore invest in venture. For example, some of our companies like Proximy is an augmented reality platform for hospitals right, to allow surgeons to stream into an OR. That saves lives. It's an amazing technology. It's globally scaled. If you take a look at financial inclusion, our, through our portfolio, 10 million people now have access to the financial network that before it didn't. So funding these companies that can do well and do good and really impact people's lives, even in a very small way, is necessary when we think about how we allocate capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, today, you guys are considered by many as one of the leading VCs <clears throat> in the region, as I said in the, in the intro. Um, you're the first regional VC that managed to raise the um, foreign capital, right? Um, and uh, you guys are the first VC that joined the Draper uh, network, right? Yeah, so, so we, we like to be that bridge. I think a lot of people talk about building bridges. Mm -hmm. We try to think, okay, it's great to build the bridge. How can we become the bridge? Mm -hmm. So how can we have investors, international investors, so 60% of our first fund, the LPs were based in the U.S. And that's important because that knowledge transfer mm -hmm. is fundamental to our portfolio, to our founders, and to us as investors. And these people have been doing venture for 20 and 30 years. So yes, please let us know what are some of the tricks of the trade, what can we learn? And then obviously we modify that for emerging markets and for our markets specifically, but it's good to learn from the experts mm -hmm. and they have been doing this much longer than we have. Yeah, and I don't know how many episodes ago I talked to Basil and we talked about that, how this is important for the region as well, because this is kind of, not, it's a recognition that, that good things are happening and that someone from U.S. is willing to put money in, in this region is, is, is quite significant. Um, you managed to, in, in Global Ventures, and I've been reading, and I know you read a lot. I'm not sure if you still read. Uh, last time I checked, you were reading like 52 big, uh, books uh, a I year. I read about a, a book a week, sometimes That's two amazing. books. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 
So you probably read a bunch of books about, you know, popular and famous startups like Netflix and mm -hmm. Facebook and, and like, I don't know, Apple and all of these guys. And every each of these books have at least one chapter about the team, how the team was important and how, you know, initially, you know, the team founding team, you know, managed to scale the business later on. And, and so and you managed to, to build a, a great team in global ventures. Um, how do you do it? Like, what's the, the, the secret sauce behind building a, a strong team? Not only Global Ventures, you, you successfully built, you know, a couple of companies b before. Um, I think it's about passion. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that the passion and the fire for what you do comes naturally. And surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded and who have that same passion, that same drive um, is really important. I also think that leading by example is super important. So it's really hard to expect people to show up at eight if you're going to show up at 10, right? I mean, we believe in flex time. And, you know, and since we started the firm, we did two office days a week. Now we're doing three office days a week really to build culture and to get to know each other better. Um, but I do think that you know, people look up to their leaders and will do as they do, not as they say. Mm -hmm. And it's important to keep that in mind as a leader. But when you scale that, you know, initially, at the moment I'm reading, for example, Netflix, uh, um, mm -hmm. That Will Never Work book. <clears throat> and he's saying it was cool when there was 40 of us. You know, I, I knew most of them, but then we started scaling and, you know, you, you don't know most of people. How do you actually scale then, you know, you know yeah. all of that? So in Depa, we went from 1,000 people in 2005 to 9,500 in 2008, That's it, yeah. and from six markets to 22. So it's really hard to scale and maintain culture. I think that part of the, part of the secret sauce to maintaining culture is communication. Mm -hmm. So the more you communicate, the more you communicate what's important, the more you, there's the why, right? It's not the what and the how, it's the why. It's always about the why. Why do we do things a certain way? Why is this important? Um, then you can maintain culture, because people resonate with the why. The what and the how are just details. Okay, yeah. And, and I'm sure that this is what you're looking for in startups as well. Yes, of course. <laughs> put a note, guys, put a note. Um, one of the team members from Global Ventures, do you say GV or to, to make it shorter? Well, whatever, <laughs> whatever makes you happy. <laughs> one, of the, one of the partner side said that um, getting commoditized, um, sorry, said that capital is getting commoditized and that's, uh, that the need for smart capital is getting higher. Um, what's your differentiator, differentiation strategy here uh, when it comes to putting capital out there? So we've built a framework which we call PARTNER mm -hmm. and P-A-R-T-N-E-R, -E each one stands for something very specific. It's a proprietary internal framework um, and that's how we add value to founders post-investment. So we work with our founders very closely. We call them every two weeks and the big question we ask them is what are your two biggest challenges so we can help them solve them or try at least with the full recognition that sometimes something seems like a big deal to the founder but to somebody else it's something that can be solved with a two minute phone call as opposed to the founder spending five days working on it. And as a founder I find the same thing sometimes with our investors where I think something's such a big deal in my head but then I talk to one of our investors and they're like oh I can fix that. <laughs> it's like really? That's great. <laughs> um, you should have said something three weeks ago. <laughs> Probably. So we get to a point where we think of ourselves as the extended team. We've built this proprietary framework. We've built an intranet called the library. So it's really all of our resources are available to our founders from PR to legal to recruiting. We've structured partnerships with two of the top recruiting firms globally so that across our portfolio, founders can have access to these recruiters. So that's how we try to get involved and engage in helping the founders operationally. Mm. So you said partners, each letter stands for, for yes, one. Yes, don't trust me. Saeed's the one who's in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> you need to send Saeed, you know. Eventually, I'm going to interview all of you. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? It global is Venture Series, you know, the Change Officer Global Venture Series. Um, all right. Um, how do you make sure that you systematically stay true to that promise? All right. You get a couple of startups on board, you know, at the moment, I'm not sure if this is the question that I can ask or not. Like, mm -hmm. how many startups do you have on board? 27. 27, all right. So it's becoming like a big operation. It's a firm. Like, it's it's yes. a firm, yeah. At one point, there will be 100. Um, maybe. Maybe. How do you, all right, there's a lot of, you know, VCs out there. Um, and 
a lot of nice discussions are happening in the beginning. You know, we're going to give you capital, we're going to help you out, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but it's challenging to stay true to that promise of truly helping startups on day-to-day -day basis or weekly basis. How do you systematically stay stay to, true to that? What's your strategy so that you continuously actually provide them support? So first of all, you know, the old adage, what gets measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. right? So we measure our, our I guess, input into the founders' lives. Um, but it has to be reactive to what they need. We can't say, here's our template, this is what we're going to do, and not, not, that might not be useful. So we work with founders, like I said, every two weeks, it's a call, what are your two biggest challenges, how can we help, how can we support, um, and then we've built this framework. And for us doing that and allocating, we have three people that all they do is post-investment value creation. So it's really that portfolio engagement and that portfolio management to identify what are, and then what are the common themes across all these founders and how can we support, how can we enable. Um, and then every month, there's a summary. Where are you on this? Where are you on that? So we measure it mm. and that way we can manage it. That makes sense, yeah. Um, all right, one question regarding venture capital. Yes. What's a commonly held belief about venture capital firms that you passionately disagree with? That we're aggressive. <laughs> I think that people think of VCs as, you know, they're aggressive, they're going to take too much equity, they want to reduce the valuation. It's in nobody's best interest for us to reduce the valuation. We want the founders to be incentivized. We want the cap table to make sense. We want the right valuation so that in the next round you can have a nice up round rather than a very rich valuation right now, which puts everybody in trouble in 18 months. Um, so we are on the same side as the founders. And I think that the misconception is that we are on opposite sides of the table. I think maybe the reason why they think like that is because you have to be extremely practical in, in your approach. I mean, how many startups do you, do you see a year? So um, we're seeing now about 300 a month. 300, but you in the process of reviewing, there is like a lot more probably. Yeah. yeah. So 300 every month. So we're seeing about 3,000 a year, just over 3,000 So they can't expect to go for coffee with you. <laughs> yeah, I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, just a, it's just a machine that you need to make working and, yeah. and need to deliver because you're responding to others as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, and um, in the world of venture capital, what should everyone stop doing? Competing. <laughs> I think it's a very collaborative space, and I think that the more we collaborate and cooperate with each other, um, the more the founders win. All right. And then the opposite, what should everyone start doing? Collaborating. <laughs> <So> <laughs> this was easy. It's the, same, it's the same question, just the other side of the coin. <laughs> All right, switching gears now. Um, talking a bit more about you. You've been around the world, you moved places with your parents when you were a young girl, you've studied abroad. How did this whole journey influence you as a, as a person? So there's a, there's a term called third culture. Have you come across this term? No. So there's third culture kids and then third culture individuals mm -hmm. once the kids grow up, I assume. Um, it's on Wikipedia, it's a well-known term that I only found out about about two years ago. And it talks about people who are from one place ethnically, raised in another, but then live in a third. All right. And it's clearly a very quickly growing group of people around the world. I think last time Wikipedia checked, it was in the tens of millions, but I don't know. Um, and so now there's research and there's books written about TCKs, third culture kids. Their adaptability, their flexibility, their ability to identify with many cultures, um, but not feel like somewhere's home. So I think, you know, for me, it was always a big struggle in that, where is home? Well, you know, if it's, people ask, where are you from? Well, how long do you have, <laughs> right, is, is, is the question I have for them. Um, you know, and my kids now have the same struggle, and someone say, well, where are you from? And they look at them like, really, do I have to answer you? How long do you have? Um, so I think that that really makes you adaptable and flexible at the same time. You know, it makes you feel like the whole world is your home, but there's no deep roots. Mm. And you studied abroad. Um, this is something that I'm really curious to kind of uh, investigate <clears throat> on a personal level, how e each life journey affects who you are. You know, how did you become mm. new who you are? And, and one of the questions that I'm trying to answer is like this whole concept of formal education as it is, mm. how important it is. Okay, it's important. but how big of an impact did it have on your life, formal education and school? 
Um, so school had Your a big kids will be watching this one day. <laughs> <laughs> school had a big impact. I was just going to say. Um, so school had a big impact. And I grew up, so I was in London for my childhood, which was a very rigid British system. Um, and then we went to Saudi Arabia for a few years and I was in American school, which, you know, taught me very quickly um, more adaptability. And we had subjects like archaeology when I was 12 years old, where we would literally dig up the desert and which is very different to a British system where I was learning Latin and physics and coding. I learned how to code when I was eight. Wow. So, you know, that was very, very um, British. And then the American one was very, very no uniforms, no nothing, as opposed to the British where I had a summer uniform or a winter uniform and your hat had to be on the right way and your socks had to be a certain height. And I could tie a bow behind my back before I was six, right? Because that was a British uniform. And then you go to a no uniform and school is half day until one o'clock and it's always sunny in Saudi versus rainy in London. And then we came to Dubai when I was 15 and I went to Shwefat for a couple of years. And that was neither British nor American. It was just here, memorize, and we're going to test you every single day on a different subject. Um, and so and no matter how well you do, you're never going to get above 16 out of 20. So then... Compared to the American system, where it's all about confidence building, here was somewhere where it didn't matter how much you studied, you were never going to do well. Um, so that was Shreifat. So I was raised between all these different systems where you very quickly learn as a child that, you know, it does, sometimes it doesn't matter how hard you study, you're never going to do well. You still have to study hard. Um, and then I went to college in Boston, mm -hmm. which was very interesting. Um, and I went to Boston College, which was very, very American. Um, so the first day I walked onto campus, it looked like, you know, a Banana Republic catalog. Everyone's in khakis and white shirts, which is very different to Dubai, which is much more, <laughs> you know, jeans and T-shirts. And, um, and so that was a culture shock. And again, college was, after Shreifat, very, very easy because Shreifat is a very difficult school. Um, and that, that's when I explored a lot more. So mm. the beautiful thing about liberal arts is you do everything in your freshman year. So sociology, psychology, theology, so the comparative religion studies between like the, the three key religions for a year. NBC being a Jesuit institute was great at that. Um, art, um, back to biology, right? So when you do all these different subjects in your first year and you're 18, um, it's very refreshing, mm. right? And then I focused on finance, economics, pre-law. I always wanted to be a lawyer. Since Period. you were a since I was girl. very little, wow. I love to argue, um, <laughs> and, so, and so you know, and the logic and the reasoning behind arguing always appealed to me. So I always wanted to be a lawyer. By the time I finished pre-law, I discovered that I hated studying law, so I could <laughs> I could not think of doing four years of grad school, and so that was the end of my my dreams of being a lawyer. Mm, what part of the school were you would you like? you know, take on the side and say, look, this was the, probably the most important for me. Like this had the, the most impact on my life. Um, of college or of earlier schooling? Well, let's say in, in, in whole. The variety. So I played piano. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately in college, I played for the orchestra, right? So learning music and, you know, my boys play piano and people tell me they're never going to be musicians. I say, maybe not. But the ability to sit and see that this piece of music is very difficult. I can't play it. And practice, practice, practice. And 10 days later, you create music. Especially for this generation of instant gratification and if it's hard, I don't want to try, right? And those kind of mindsets that this younger generation has, I think is fundamentally important. So when something is difficult, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you need to try. And it's the progress principle. Every day you're slightly better. If you practice for 15 minutes a day at the end of 10 days, you can actually play this piece of music. So principles like that, I think you'll learn in your education process without it being a lesson that you study. No one's going to teach you this. Mm. You learn it through the practice of music, of a sport, of anything where, but that principle, I think in music is much more clear because you can actually hear the piece at the end, mm. right? And then whereas in sports, it's, you know, what if the other person competing against you or what if the shot came differently? I think in music, it's you own it, you master it, and you can master anything, and it teaches you that. Yeah, it's powerful. It's, it, it's, it, you're on your own, so you're kind of mastering, you know, you're, you're fighting against yourself. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's a strong message. <laughs> um, so you heard about probably that, you know, bad times are making strong people, strong people are making good times, good times are making weak people, weak people are making bad times. <clears throat> and 
most people out there you know you very very often you can hear you know that now are good times making like weak people and 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 now these new generations are going through a very kind of comfortable um life how do you navigate through that how do you pick the best combination of education uh, in these early, early days and later on for, for, for kids to set them uh, on the right course. You have three boys, so probably you've been thinking about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think there's one right answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's about having a holistic individualized approach. So it's who is this person, right? And being able to tap into someone's personality, who they are, what they enjoy, what they love, what they're passionate about, what they're good at, right? And using that to form something, right? And to enable them to be the best person that they can be. Hmm. Um, that I think is the point of education, right? Is giving people the skill set and the tools that they need to be the best version of themselves that they can be. All right. Okay, you got me thinking and inspired, but I hope everyone else out there is, eventually I'm going to find the answer to all of my questions. Um, all right, I have one, one, one interesting question. You probably heard about this global movement. Uh, uh, they have events all, all over the world. How I F word up, because your kids will be watching this one day. Uh, I don't want to swear. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, you know which one I'm referring to. Maybe you heard about it. No, which one? Uh, but basically, they're celebrating failures. So yes. instead of inviting people to talk about uh, their successes, uh, and everyone today is being praised for their successes, LinkedIn is full of successes, but nobody is really sharing their failures, which are, if not more, equally important. Mm -hmm. um, the lessons that you learned from the failures. <clears throat> Can you share with us a story about the failure that you had in your life that maybe set you uh, up for a later success in your life or that taught you a, a big lesson? Um, sure. So I think it depends how you define failure. I always think that failure is only failure if you define it as such. Otherwise, it was an experiment. Mm -hmm. And you learn different things from different experiments. I think so one time about, I want to say, seven or eight years ago, I wanted to start a small catering business. All right. But very specific for schools so moms or parents could subscribe and we would deliver lunch to the school it would be a hot lunch and it would be healthy and you would sign up the schools and then the schools would encourage the parents to sign up um you know started got it rolling realized that there was too many logistical issues too many health concerns um you know we started getting people signing up and then complaining and with these things even if you have 95 percent customer satisfaction that's still too low <laughs> right so um so I quickly decided that if i was ever going to do a business again it would not include food it would not include logistics it would not include a bunch of things um that weren't uh worth it and that the b2b to c model is actually incredibly difficult to do this was pre kind of digital let's order everything Era, online yeah. now my kids at school i go onto their app every weekend and they order exactly what they want from their cafeteria it gets delivered to their classroom so it's exactly the same but it's run by a massive catering company and uh -huh. they just went digital so i looked at that the other day when they were ordering and i was i was thinking that's exactly what i wanted to do but it was seven years ago so the, another learning there is it's about timing right so we couldn't have done this seven years ago because the market timing was off we couldn't do it digitally um, you know, people weren't ready for it and so on. No, I, I think timing is big. You probably read the book Outliers mm -hmm. or you heard about it. Yes. <clears throat> um, it's exactly that, yeah. you know, there are so many people out there who were just not at the right place at the right time. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good lesson. All right. My next question, credits go to, to Tim Ferriss, probably familiar or not. Yeah. Um, in the last five years, what new belief? behavior or habit has most improved your life training in the gym all right so i started exercising in the gym about goodness three or four years ago um before that i had never walked into a gym in my life at, all. A, at all ever piano ever. was the only <laughs> yoga <laughs> workout i was a big yogi all i did was yoga i started that's, yoga that's kind of a gym now and i started yoga 20 years ago Wow. And it's all I practiced. And maybe I might occasionally do Pilates. But that was the extent. Pilates of it. can be tough. Pilates can be tough. <laughs> but I'd never gone into a gym. 
And then in 2017, I started training in the gym. Um, yeah, I have my first triathlon coming up in two weeks. No way. Yeah. Um, full distance? Full distance, classic. Wow. I climbed Kilimanjaro last year. Wow. I lift a lot, I box. You box? I started boxing. You don't look like you're boxing. <laughs> I'm, I box. <laughs> so all these things, right? And even I lift, I lift a lot. And wow. I really enjoy it. So it's something that if you had told me five years ago, in five years, you're going to be training and lifting and doing your deadlifts. And I would have thought, no way. Well, uh, yoga and then deadlifting. But I boxing. also do yoga. <laughs> I still do my yoga. Wow. So it's um, so that's something that I've recently discovered and I really, really enjoy. How did it impact your life? Um, first of all, I think that anything new you try opens up new parts of your brain. Right. That's so a good way to look the, at it, the yeah. personal learning journey. And then the other thing is when I first started lifting, I could barely lift, I don't know, half my body weight. Right now I can lift a lot more than my body weight. And in seeing that progress, again, the progress principle, right? So in the beginning, I can't do it. This is impossible. And then ultimately you do it. And it's like, wow, I, you can train and do something. And if you think about it, if you do that for your body muscle, you can also do that for your mind muscle, for your brain for anything that it's really a matter of practice persistence and you can keep changing and going and evolving i'm sure eventually i'll get bored of the gym i get bored of things <laughs> eventually but also then i think that's why i'm now doing this triathlon where it's you know the there endurance is, side of things there is um you heard about spartan race probably yes yeah, so in end of uh, this year in november in abu dhabi it's a world championship yeah. spartan beast 21 kilometers yeah. with obstacles no thank you I officially, public, no, I no. publicly challenge you. No, I won't accept. <laughs> I double dare you <laughs> based on the kids. But no, I think that for, you know, for setting these challenges and these goals is just part of, you know, pushing yourself to keep growing. No, that's true. I mean, there is a lot of similarities with business as well. Yeah. I mean, from company to company, growing one, exiting one, building the next one. Yeah. Probably it's part of your just uh, uh, DNA. Um, I mentioned Ray Dalio before. He wrote the book Principles, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he is basically talking about his life and, and work principles. And some of them that he's mentioning are like for, for on, on the life side, embrace reality and deal with it, mm -hmm. or uh, be radically open-minded. Do you have or did you develop certain principles in your life over the, the previous 15, 20 years or, or more? that you're sticking to and that are shaping who you are today and your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. So I have a list of them. Oh. <laughs> so, and none of them are original to me. Um, I think that, you know, you start your day with gratitude and you, you keep in mind that the real, the only constant in life is change. And that's not just a saying. It's really the only way that your day is going to happen is the way it's meant to happen. It's not the way you've planned it. You need to plan it regardless, but then it's going to evolve. And things are gonna keep changing, um, and it's your job to kind of roll with the punches. And to the extent that it's what you planned, that's great, maybe. And to the extent that it's not what you planned, you have to have conviction that the universe has a better plan than you do. And when I approach things with that mindset, it actually makes the journey of life much more interesting, much more easy um, and you can just smile when things don't go your way and say, okay, I'm so angry, but I'm sure there's a good reason why rather than get very, very upset about it. That's interesting. That's one. Do you have any other that you want to share? That's like four altogether. The only uh, constant in life is change, right. gratitude, <laughs> <laughs> roll with the punches. Hey, you, you see, you should, uh, uh, no, it's no strange that you're studying law, law, you know, you should be a lawyer. Right? You see how you're spinning things. <laughs> Um, All right. Yeah. Um, I have another interesting question for you as well. Uh, it's also based on uh, on the book, and the book is setting the stage up for it. Um, have you heard about or read the book Ikigai? No. Ikigai? All right. I found a book that you didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> okay. So um, Ikigai roughly translates into reason for being, uh, and it's a Japanese formula for happiness. Okay. Um, so finding your ikigai means having a purpose in life that fulfills not only your desires, but also world's needs. Mm -hmm. um, and if that is something that you love, you will naturally want you to do it every day. Um, 
so they also describe it and there is like a like a small uh, drawing here as well Merci. yeah so it's between uh, what you love uh, what you're good at mm -hmm. um, what you can get paid for yeah and what the world needs yes so the question is a lot of people are on the life journey of finding their ikigai i don't know if i found my ikigai maybe occasionally yeah. during the day <laughs> but they, sometimes they also describe it as things that you can get lost in do it like for 24 hours and just don't pay attention to time so the question is have you found found your your ikigai or you're close to it so do you only have one you can have many you can have many you can have if you're lucky you can have many and then it can change it can back change. to the only Evolve. constant is change yeah, exactly right yeah. so yes yeah, so i think that right now what i do at at global ventures is definitely my ikigai mm -hmm. when i show up in the office the next thing i know it's 10 hours later i'm in my flow and there's different parts of the business that have me different states of flow so whether i'm with founders whether we're with investors whether we're managing the firm um different levels of flow um and then running, I love running. So that's another thing that I love to do. But if you took me 10 years ago, I have told you for sure, building Zen yoga is definitely <laughs> better for the world, bringing wellness. And we had 72 teachers and the yoga teacher training. And that was my ikigai at that point in time. And even working with the family business and creating a global best practice company out of the region, re-emphasize the region. And I was in flow when I was doing those things. Um, and when I was practicing yoga and in meditating until now. So I think that it comes and goes depending on where you are in your life journey. And there are definitely days where, you know, you're in flow more than other days um, and w where your energy shifts and changes. Um, but I think that for now, yes. When you talk about it, it sounds so easy, regardless of ikigai or not. <laughs> but some people, a lot of people out there are just struggling to find one thing that they really love to do and they enjoy it and they can get paid for it, they can live out of. Um, it seems like that you've been continuously doing what you love while making uh, it worthwhile and, 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 uh, uh, and living out of it. Was this something that you kind of worked on over the years to build yourself like you are or you were born with it or like how do you explain it? It seems like you have, you know, studying one company, another company, third, fourth, venture capital. I think it's about listening to your intuition. And I think, you know, when I, very early in life, I started on a yoga meditation journey. That was about 20 years ago. And I had to take a pause from what I was doing because I was not in a state of flow and I was getting quite ill. And it was very much stress related. And so 20 years ago, I discovered that stress is not my friend. And so I had to stop stressing out. And when I stopped stressing out, I actually, it was the only semester that I got a 4.0 GPA. Oh. And so I, was, I said to myself- How did you just stop stressing out? Oh, I started doing yoga and meditating. All right. So it was literally a wake up mm. call and mm. it was, okay, this is not working. And so when I started doing yoga and meditating and starting to think I should do things more smartly, and so it's working smart versus working hard. So I still work hard, but really sleeping well um, and taking care of really integrating, right? And thinking about your mind and how you integrate and what you're passionate about. And, and then you can get to a level where you're creative. If I'm passionate about this and I'm good at that, maybe I can do this other thing. Um, so that was 20 years ago. And every, everyone has ebbs and flows. I have good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. But generally, when I remember that actually when you're in a state of oneness with yourself and true to who you are, then you can be a lot more creative and add a lot of value and people will ultimately be happy to pay you for that value that you're adding rather than you know, trying to force things and put you know, what is it, a, a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. So it's not easy, but the work is internal. And once you start working on your own meditation and your own state and your own mindset, then things around you start to change. And if that's hard to believe, then I say, you know, and I tell my kids, I'm like, maybe it's not that things around you start to change, maybe it's that you start to see them differently. Hmm. And if you see things differently, you respond differently, and then the universe responds in a better way. But it's about seeing them differently, and that's an internal mindset. All right. Sorry, it's not supposed to be meditation and mindset lecture. <laughs> but that's a book worth reading. Have you read Mindset? 
I didn't, but I heard you uh, in yeah. one of the podcasts or some of the shows. You said, you talked about it, and I wrote it down yeah. that I want to read. There are some great books, and really, it's about how you switch your mindset to find your zone of genius mm. or your ikigai. And another question: I don't know, it didn't end up on my sheets. Um, you're recommending the book "Hard Thing" about hard things. What was the hardest thing that you had to do in your life? Um, probably raising. The raising Global Ventures Fund. Oh, really? One. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I think that that was one of the hardest things. And I think that it was hard specifically because everybody told me this is going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do. And my reaction was, eh, you know, who how told, hard can who, it be? Who told you that? Everybody who's ever raised a VC fund or tried. And I said, how hard can it be? How hard can it be? And then I went and it was a year and nine months of... In total, a year and nine months took to you raise to, to raise one. first fund. Wow. The average takes two years, so we're like right on the average mark. And it's larger than a typical first-time fund, but the region needed it. But still, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. We saw 392 potential investors. So Say it again. 392 potential investors, wow. right? And you end up... And then with, startups are saying it's, it's, it's hard to raise money. I think that's what startups <laughs> forget is that the VCs also need to raise money. <laughs> so as a VC, we also have to go raise our funds. Um, and so fund one, that's how many investors. So think about how many no's we got. So dealing with all that rejection, 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 and still getting up in the morning with all the belief and conviction um, is a really hard thing to do. I didn't even know that you can find. 392 <laughs> potential investors, yes, you can, for sure. <laughs> so Wow. Yeah. Um, honestly, I'm pretty sure that at least more than 50% startups out there don't understand how VC actually works. That VC goes and, and raises funds. I'm pretty sure about it. Probably the mature startups who are already experienced in raising funds understand that part. All right. You've been asked a lot of questions over the previous, especially since Global Ventures started, you've been under a spotlight uh, in Dubai and you've been attended so many shows, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a question that nobody asked you so far and that you would like to give an answer to? No. No? I'm very outspoken. If there was, <laughs> I would have probably shared it by Is now. There, okay, rephrasing the question. Is there a question that nobody asked you ever before? Not that I can think of. Or I would have suggested it to you, Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, to call it uh, um, uh, for, for the end, I have a game for you. Okay. So, um, I'm going to say uh, one versus two, and then you just tell me one or two, all right? Mm. Um, innovation versus emulation. One. I mean, you can say innovation. Innovation. Yeah. Agritech versus edtech. 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 CTO versus CFO. CTO. Jeff Bezos versus Elon Musk. Jeff Bezos. Mom's World versus Manchon. I can't. I can't pick from my portfolio. That's not fair. <laughs> Book versus movie. Book. Three Fields versus Main. I can't pick from two of my favorite restaurants. You have to pick one. Well, it's like you know, it's, they're different. One is sushi or like Japanese food, and the other is like today. Proper seafood. No. Today, Three Fields. No right. <laughs> Education versus experience. Experience. Bitcoin versus gold. Bitcoin. Thanks for coming, Noor. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for staying until the end. I hope that you enjoyed this session. It was very fun for me. I, I hope that you pick up some good uh, insights uh, and inspirations. And uh, stay with us. There is another episode coming out on Monday. Until then, please like and subscribe if you like what we're doing here with the Change Officer. Noor, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.